Um, these are some of the um, African leaders from that period. Um, incidentally, the paintings, the nice paintings, are all cover paintings from Time magazine. So these were not just fringe people, except uh, Anna Parker Brown. Um, Patrice Lumumba was the um, independence leader of the Congo. He was uh, someone who, when the King of Belgium came to the Congo's independence celebrations, uh, to say how he was handing over the baton to Patrice as um, after Belgium had done so much to civilise the country, one who actually stood up at the thing and said this was rubbish, um, that uh, Belgium had been a disaster for Congo. Uh, he was later killed by a combination of the, uh, the Belgians, the Americans, and the UN, and various other bad people. I'll now hand it back here. We have um, Kwame Nkrumah, who was the independence leader of Ghana. He was someone who um, led um, a mass struggle for got Ghana to be the, the um, first country to be uh, granted independence from the, from the British Empire. We had um, Julius Nyerere, who was the leader of the Tanzania, who developed ideas of, uh, of African socialism. Um, and here, he never made the cover of time, as far as I know, Zemel Kakebrao who was a revolutionary guerrilla leader and theoretician in, in Guinea Bissau. And I could, uh, could go on and mention other people like uh, Jomo Kenyatta or a more radical woman in Kenya, Bildad Kagya. It could mention Samora Michelle or even later figures like Robert Mugabe, um, who was seen as a, as a revolutionary leader in his time. But in, in all cases, we have enormous criticisms of these people. I think they all made mistakes and very few of them uh, achieve what they were setting out to achieve. Uh, but then neither Che Guevara, and people remember him as someone who had a spirit of resistance, and he's someone whose politics I'm criticised enormously. But I think one of the things that I really want to challenge is the idea that there is no revolutionary tradition in Africa. There is a revolutionary tradition, and most of these people uh, would, have cons would have considered themselves to be socialists. Uh, many of them would have called themselves Marxists. Um, and um, so I think that so that's the starting point of start from is that there, there is a revolutionary tradition in Africa. There's a tradition of people fighting back. And often these people were people who were at the head of mass movements. Um, and um, I think that there's, uh, we need to talk about this when you start seeing um, the likes of Al Ferguson, the Tory pet historian, who comes along and says, actually, uh, the empire was a good thing. When you had the empire, people in Africa had wealth. Uh, you know, things were getting better, they got education. Then the British went to Ireland and fell apart. Um, I do think it's worth remembering that these people who became independence leaders at the time, actually health standards, education standards, all these informally black people left. They all got much bit better. Um, when you started seeing independence coming, it was to the enormous benefit of, of ordinary people. Um, so the immediate question then is, how did we get from there? from the inspirational period in the 60s to now. Um, and I think that there were real problems. And one problem was that the imperialists never really retreated. They wanted to move their troops out, but still keep some kind of control over, over what was going on. Africa had a problem of being uh, on the front line in the Cold War. So you started seeing uh, people put in place uh, or backed up who would, didn't matter how they treated their own people as long as they took the right side in the Cold War divide. So they saw a group of people like Mobutu being backed uh, by the West all the way through the Cold War. Um, as some of them are still primarily uh, used by the world economy for producing um, raw materials, uh, the slump in the 1970s enormously damaged the African countries. Um, and um, this meant that when you saw um, countries got into debt, when world, uh, Western banks in the 70s started looking for places where they could make a profit, one of the things they did was go out and make spend lots of loans to Africa, which, um, which led to the, to the debt, debt crisis. And the first uh, structural adjustment program was actually used in Ghana in, uh, in 1979. Uh, and the, the whole um, use of neoliberalism in cross um, <coughs> Africa has been disastrous. I mean, it has made things worse for, for the majority of people. And um, 
to the extent that one of the, the tricks that was used was to stop calling structural investment programs structural investment programs because they were so unpopular and were leading to riots, and they were relaying the poverty reduction programs, which was, um, didn't actually make a lot of difference. They still made people's lives awful. But let me say, do we need a revolutionary change, which is what I'm supposed to be concentrating on? If you would you talk to many liberal commentators on Africa, they'd say, no, we don't, because that's all true in the past, but once the Cold War finished, things started changing. Uh, and you started seeing uh, across um, sub-Saharan Africa now, most countries call themselves democracies. Uh, actually, the dictators and the Mobutus were swept aside, um, and the people who are in that tradition now are, um, are in a minority. Uh, to talk to Larry Diamond, who's a commentator, he says, uh, even where elections are unfair and rulers abusive, African civil societies are becoming more vigorous, more experienced, and committed to democratic norms. So what you're actually seeing is you don't need a revolutionary change. You're seeing a shift away from dictatorship towards a place where ordinary people in Africa have, uh, have more of a say. Um, and I think, at one level, there's some truth in this. It's that there are more um, <laughs> democracies across Africa. But we're seeing something else, that people elected these people because they wanted change. They didn't elect them because they wanted democracy in the abstract, because they wanted to be able to go to the ballot box. They wanted the things that were making their lives awful uh, to go away. And on the whole, this hasn't happened. Uh, and what's happened is the people who've come into power uh, have tended to perpetuate the problems. Um, and I think to take two recent examples, uh, what's happened in, uh, in Kenya and in Zimbabwe, you've seen governments that have come in promising that they're going to make radical changes, uh, they haven't made them, uh, and then have tried to cling on to power even when they've, uh, when they've lost the election. So the idea of holding only on to power is something that, uh, something, that, something that continues. So I think that the form of democracy, and this is something that's true in the West to a lesser extent, but then you have the form of democracy that's not the same as actually having control over society and over what's, um, what's going on. So I think this is a problem with the, that you do need some kind of a revolutionary change. You actually need to push aside uh, the way that things are being run. And I, I will come back to that um, uh, in, in a minute. Uh, but you do see it, even in the longer standing box, like even in South Africa, the kind of feeling of tiredness with what the, uh, the ANC has been doing, and the lack of, uh, lack of um, rate of change for, for all these people. Um, but I do want to concentrate on the idea of fighting uh, and what we need specifically socialist change in Africa. Because um, one thing that you find, and I've been reading quite a lot of books and so on, on uh, what's wrong in Africa in the past, uh, in the run up to this meeting, is that almost all books just leave out the idea of imperialism. People often start, and they've put a quite good program on Radio 4 recently, they've talked about Congo, and it started from Leopold in the 19th century, and how evil he was, uh, and how that was a, a bad legacy. But from the way that they did the report, you would not believe that imperialism had existed since then. And the way that people talk now is it's always the, the problems that Africa has are down to bad governance, or they have no traditions of being efficient, or all sorts of things. Nothing is to do with the fact that the um, imperial legacy is still there. And it's not just something as uh, people identify you know, imperialism with, um, with colonialism. So it all finished when the colonial empires uh, went away. And I think um, it's, this has been one of the, uh, the difficulties that a lot of African socialists have had. And it's partly, um, I haven't got time to go in depth into the, what the different uh, people believe when they talk about African socialism. People may want to bring up particular regimes in the discussion, but um, most of them had a, an idea that came from the Stalinist or Maoist tradition of what it is that you actually mean by socialism. And what it meant largely was taking control of the state um, and then using the state uh, to create a better conditions <coughs> for the ordinary people and the peasantry um, uh, inside that country. Um, and when they failed to do that, it goes, so that, well, that's the end of socialism. Yeah.